Hello and welcome. My name's John Getter, and we really appreciate you joining us for this special program today about a very difficult and important topic facing all of America. Wildland Urban Interface Fires. It's a mouthful, but more than that, it could be a major threat to your community if you don't prepare properly, and that's what we're about today. What are Wildland Urban Interface Fires? What are they like? What happens when these fires hit communities? Uh, how does it affect the firefighters, the homeowners? We're going to be addressing all of that today, and we're going to start out by asking that simple question, what are they, of Bill Mills from Colorado Springs Fire Department. Bill? Wildland Urban Interface Fire uh, is unique in that um, we're talking about disciplines in agency or community or in, in the value programming of firefighters uh, from natural fuels to man-made fuels or vice versa. And the primary carriers in most cases in wildfire would be your natural fuels as carried to the constructed fuels or the structures that the urban firefighters are interested in. Um, so it's a really, it's an interesting collision of, of, of not only physics in that the natural fuels uh, and their relationship with the structure is, is a physical property, but it's a behavioral piece also. Uh, behavioral in that um, wildfire types that come through the agency's value program early in their careers in a specific way, in a way of thinking, believing, and behaving. And, and the structure fire types come up through a different world. And so as we work together, uh, now we're we're not only changing some physical properties as it relates to wildfire and structures natural fuels but we're changing some behavioral properties as well and bill it's interesting to know too you use these two phrases together that a lot of people probably over time have not considered together both urban and wildland because they really do affect each other even though they're very different and they are affecting more and more people as i understand it really rule of thumb is that anywhere natural fuel comes adjacent to constructed fuel or structures uh, you might have a notion of wildland urban interface um, many definitions uh, classic urban interface or classic interface might be something that's viewed as having a, a very typical frontier in other words you can turn and point to the forest and see it um, Intermix may be something as sim uh, simple as structures and urban density as it relates to forest. Uh, occluded interface might be uh, development that simply surrounds our notion of what forest might be. So rule of thumb is that just about any place that you could come up with natural fuel as it relates to constructed fuel could be considered this notion of interface or intermix. It's a big topic and we have some big help today. Joining us uh, along with, uh, with Bill is Mike Darty, the U.S. Fire Administration. Also Dan Bailey from the uh, U.S. Forest Service. And uh, over here on the uh, far end of the table is uh, Chief Will May from the Alachua County Fire and Rescue. Uh, people who don't know where Alachua County is, it's essentially Gainesville. 
Gainesville and North Florida. Yes. North Thank Florida. You. Thanks all of you for joining us today. We heard what Bill was talking about there, kind of uh, setting the table for what we're going to be discussing here, these fires. But Mike, let me ask you this. You've, you've been somebody who has, you started your career jumping out of airplanes to help <laughs> fight fires out in the woods, out in the forests. Yeah, and more and more of these, these forests in the cities are becoming almost one, aren't they? Yes, they are. I think what's important to realize is that the wildland firefighter now is having to, on a daily basis, deal with, uh, with homes and construction in the wildland setting and the urban firefighter is now having to deal with the wildland and they're coming together and I think it's very important that they learn how to to work together and and meet together and, and plan together for these events because they're going to happen in each other's backyards and, and and working together I think is going to be the key to success. Dan, uh, how do you put that into practice? Well I think that it uh, all over the United States, we're seeing you know more and more wildland urban interface fires occurring. So you know it's forcing uh, this um, interaction between structural fire departments and wildland people to uh, you know to work together. And when I say forcing, it, 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 there's a lot of training, a lot of things happening uh, mm -hmm. you know in advance of these. But it's really kind of uh, bridging the gap of what it's been you know a decade ago with these two. Uh, uh, you know, wildland structural people working together in, uh, in an effective way to deal with these types of fires. And Will, have you found uh, big changes in the last several years because of the development in your area where, where uh, the, the, these two areas are coming together and you're fighting different fires than you may have a few years ago because of the, this confluence of people and the wildlands? Yes, we are. Uh, with the rapidly increasing population of Florida and most of those that most of that population growth are folks that are not familiar with the Florida situation they typically retired from uh, remoter parts of the of the nation um, what we're finding is that since about the mid 90s uh, that uh, in Florida the structural fire service and the wildland fire service uh, at which is primarily a, a state level service have begun to work more and more together uh, we're cross training uh, the, uh, the wildland firefighters are receiving a uh, NFPA Firefighter 1 level of structural fire protection training and uh, the, the structural firefighters are going and getting the training at least to the Firefighter 2 level in wildland standards. We're also picking up the incident command system that has been used for many years by the wildland services and we're integrating that into our process. Dan, I would think a lot of folks watching this might have the initial impression that, that gee, I wouldn't expect to hear about this in Florida. I always thought these were in the big forest that people like you help us take care of out in the west, in the mountains and so on. And they certainly are there, but they've been happening all around the country, right? Well, that's right. I think one of the things that people don't understand, and I think the perception is that it's always been a, a, a problem in the west, but you uh, look around over the last two decades and it's uh, wildland urban interface fires are occurring in New Jersey, New York, in Minnesota and Texas, I mean, it's pretty much across the board in every state. They're seeing these types of fires and these kinds of situations occurring. Mike, that's got to make it a, a big challenge, changing quickly, especially in light of 9-11 and the new emphasis on anti-terrorism in the country. I think so. I think that uh, the, uh, the folks working together and needing to work, work together is, is it's kind of a it's, a, it's a different culture and bringing the two cultures together is, is very important. I think that, as Dan was saying, the, uh, the interface problem as it is spread across the country, partially is, it's linked to issues related to the climate. Mm -hmm. I think we're a little bit hotter, a little bit warmer. We're finding that the, that the, uh, the fire seasons, as we call them, are, mm -hmm. are lasting longer and they're more severe. Uh, the acres burned every year is increasing. It's getting to be, it, it's getting larger and larger. And with more and more communities being built in the, in the intermix, it's creating another dimension of a problem to the firefighter. They have to dealing with public safety and, and evacuations. Mm -hmm. And they can't, and they have to deal with those before they can concentrate on, on extinguishment of the incident itself. Bill Mills, these fires seem very different. Uh, they, they behave in ways that can be very different from simple wildfires and simple building fires, I understand. 
it's very, uh, very opportunistic. Uh, I know that for years and years in the fire service, we could model uh, fire behavior as it relates to, stru to structures inside the cube, inside the shape or the house. Uh, the environment is fairly static. In other words, the consideration for fire load um, and the contents, it's pretty predictable. Uh, with Mother Nature involved, uh, if the wind's up, all bets are off. Uh, fuel, weather, and topography all play dynamic parts in a wildfire, and, and dynamic meaning that just ever-changing. So notions of modeling as it relates to wildfire behavior are simply snapshots in time. Uh, the industry is moving toward more real-time looks at being able to model wildfire, but it's, it's, it's truly a dynamic event. So they're very different, they're very dynamic, they can be a big challenge for the firefighters, but many of you may not have actually seen one of these wildland urban interface fires other than little snippets in the news. So before we get too much farther into our program today, let's get a little more on these fires and how they behave. Each year thousands of wildland fire ignitions occur throughout the United States. Each of these fire starts must be managed to meet identified resource management objectives. In order to select the proper fire management option, we must have a thorough knowledge of wildland fire behavior. When an ignition occurs, it has the potential to grow into a major wildland fire, depending on the existing environmental conditions. It may have dramatic effects on resource values, appearance, and public opinion. What unleashes this powerful force of change? Well, it begins simply enough, perhaps a carelessly thrown match, an unattended campfire, or a thunderstorm. Then before long, a rapidly growing wildland fire, which requires extensive management. Yet every wildland fire that starts like this doesn't become a big fire because firefighters like you may intervene and stop it. Firefighters who know how a wildland fire behaves. In order to manage fire, you must learn the characteristics of fire and the factors that influence fire spread. The more you know about wildland fire behavior, the more likely you are to select the appropriate fire management strategy, which provides for safety while meeting resource management objectives. Fire begins with ignition. The match is the most common ignition device. Friction creates sufficient heat to ignite the phosphorus. Combustion occurs, the match flames. The three most important ingredients required for combustion are heat, oxygen, and fuel. Heat, oxygen, and fuel complete the fire triangle and are necessary components to create fire. If any of these are missing, there can be no fire. In this demonstration, we have all of the ingredients necessary for combustion. Heat from the match, oxygen from the air, and fuel in the candle. But remove one of these ingredients, in this case oxygen, and the fire goes out. The same principle is used in managing wildland fires. We control such fires by removing heat, by removing oxygen, by removing fuel. In wildland fires, heat sufficient to cause combustion is transferred to new sources of fuel in three different ways. By conduction, by convection, and by radiation. Conduction is the transfer of heat within the material itself. Most metals are good heat conductors, but wood, on the other hand, is a poor conductor and transmits heat slowly. Conduction is not an important factor in the spread of wildland fire. Convection is the transfer of heat by flow of liquids or gases. In the case of wildland fires, convection is well illustrated by the air and burned gases which rise above the fire. If the heated mixture is confined to a column, 
the convection current can be strong. Perhaps strong enough to reach 20,000 feet or higher into the atmosphere. Convection may cause dry snags to burn rapidly. Another method of transferring heat is by radiation. The Earth, for instance, is heated from the sun by radiation through space. In wildland fires, radiation will dry fuel ahead of the fire and increase its ability to ignite. How fire behaves when only one type of fuel is involved is simple in comparison with the complex nature of a wildland fire when a variety of fuels combine with weather and topography. With careful observation of fuel, weather, and topography, we can see the influence of each of these environmental elements and reasonably predict expected wildland fire behavior. The first element we must observe is fuel. Wildland fire behavior is affected by the amount of moisture in the fuel. Dry fuel burns faster than wet fuel. Size and shape of fuel is also a contributing factor. Light fuel is quickly heated and ignited as it is surrounded by plenty of oxygen. Fire in light fuel spreads rapidly, but burns out quickly. Heavy fuel warms slowly, and the interior becomes exposed to oxygen only after the outside has burned off. Fuel loading on an area is an obvious factor. The more fuel available, the more total heat output. Ordinarily, the greater the fuel loading readily available for burning, the more intense the fire will be. There is low fuel loading here. There is high fuel loading here. However, fuel loading may be arranged in different ways. Thus, continuity and arrangement may be more important than fuel loading itself. The fuel may be spread uniformly over the ground, or it may be patchy. There may be little fuel standing in the air above the ground, or there may be a lot of fuel above the ground in the form of snags, trees, and tall shrubs. All of these will affect the behavior of a wildland fire. Along with fuel, another important element affecting wildland fire behavior is weather. Temperature of the air influences fire. Temperature of the fuel determines how fast it will ignite and burn. There may be 50 degrees difference between fuel temperature in the sun and in the shade. Certainly one of the most important, least understood, and least predictable influences affecting wildland fire behavior is wind. Wind makes fire burn faster by increasing the supply of oxygen and by driving convection heat into new fuel. Wind can encourage combustion and the spread of fire in one direction, or it can cause rapid change in spread direction. Wind carries sparks and firebrands ahead of the main fire, starting spot fires. Wind increases evaporation from damp surfaces by carrying away moist air and replacing it with drier air. This directly affects fuel moisture. Fuel moisture influences wildland fire behavior because it affects the rate of combustion. When fuel is moist, combustion is slow because more heat is required to evaporate the moisture. As fuel becomes drier, more heat is available to heat the fuel itself. To demonstrate this point, the same type of fuel with different fuel moistures was burned in a special test chamber. The fuel in the upper chamber has a fuel moisture content of 7%. The fuel in the lower chamber has a fuel moisture content of 25%. All other conditions are equal. Note the higher combustion rate of the drier fuel in the upper chamber. Relative humidity is a factor of weather that indirectly affects wildland fire behavior. Dead fuel and the air are always exchanging moisture. Dry air, air characterized as having low relative humidity, takes moisture from the fuel. Fuel, in turn, takes moisture from the air when the relative humidity is high. Fuel moisture content changes in response to changes in the relative humidity of the surrounding air. 
The size of fuel will influence how quickly the fuel takes on or gives off moisture in response to a change in relative humidity. A light fuel, such as pine needles, readily shows the difference due to humidity. As fuel size increases, fuel moisture will respond slower to a change in relative humidity. All of these factors of weather, on their own or in combination, can change rapidly and will affect the behavior of a wildland fire. Topography is another environmental element to observe in order to understand wildland fire behavior. Aspect or direction in which a slope faces determines how much heating it gets from the sun. Different aspects receive sunlight at different times of day. Therefore, fuel temperature on a different aspect will change at different times throughout the day. Slope is another important influence of topography. The steeper a slope, the faster a fire burns. On a steep slope, the fuel uphill from the fire is preheated by radiation and convection and ignites easily. The position of the fire, whether near the bottom of a slope with unburned fuel above or near the top of a ridge with a change in fuel or slope ahead of the fire is another topographic factor. The basic shape of the country in the vicinity of a fire is an important influence when a wildland fire is burning in broken topography. For example, if a canyon is narrow, heat transfer by radiation can dry adjacent fuel on the opposite slope. This can allow fire to cross the canyon. Steep canyons can have the same effect on fire as the chimney on a stove. They create a forced convection. Another effect of topography is the influence of elevation. This is shown by the earlier drying out of vegetation and fuel at lower elevations in early spring. Looking back, we have seen that the fire triangle of heat, oxygen, and fuel is necessary for combustion to occur. Once a fire starts, it spreads by transferring heat energy through conduction, convection, and radiation. The behavior of a wildland fire after it is established depends on the following environmental elements. Fuel, weather, and topography, all acting together. When all three are favorable for the spread of fire, almost anything can happen. That is, anything can happen unless you, as a firefighter, intervene. One way to keep fire manageable is for you to determine fire management strategy based on your knowledge of how a wildland fire will behave in its changing environment. Is this a log or is it a fuel to sustain a fire? Is this slope merely a hard climb or is it a made to order path for fire? And is this a breathtaking view or a stoked and ready furnace waiting for ignition? Think in terms of fire behavior and firefighter safety when dealing with a wildland fire. Remember, it is the sum of many factors that makes a wildland fire burn as it does. Each area, of course, is unique, has its own concerns, its own ways of looking at issues. Most of the video that we showed you there, of course, was in mountainous areas. But, Will, we need to mention again, uh, you don't have a lot of mountains in Gainesville, but you do have more than your share of fires sometimes. Well, that's true. And, and most of the southeastern United States and the East Coast is the same way. But we tend to have a lot more dense vegetation. There's more fuel per acre. Uh, and much of that fuel has, is easily ignited and tends to burn with great intensity. So the problem remains the same, even though the environment may look a little different. The real problem is the fire that that comes uh, up in these two areas that come together, the urban and the wildland. That's where, correct. Where they come together. That's correct. Yeah. And typically it's us, it's people growing into the rural area. You bet. And Bill Mills, you always seem to be pre uh, preaching the, uh, the, the beauty of reducing risks, of mitigating. What do you think is the most important thing for people to know? Mitigation is, is the biggest bang for the buck. Mitigation is simply reducing your risk. We're never in a condition in this industry to prevent much. 
but we can make the risk smaller. And given that you would follow typical mitigation process, we can say you would have a 50-50 chance with everything that you own. And we think those are pretty good odds. So engage and share the responsibility of mitigating this hazard. And Dan, uh, there's a, a term that, uh, of, that is used that people may hear, firewise and firewise communities. Key to that is mitigating, as we say, being ready, being prepared. Very much so. I think mitigation, uh, I agree, is the most effective tool that we have in the toolbox today. And what we have to remember is the public has a responsibility uh, to uh, do things in living in the wildland urban interface. They made the decision to live there and they have some responsibilities that they need to understand to help mitigate this problem with wildland urban interface fires. And working with wildland and structural people, it's a partnership that really uh, can prove to be very effective if uh, all the players are sitting at the table and working on it. Yeah, Mike, we can't emphasize that enough, can we? That, that it is not a problem to hand off to our firefighters. It's not a problem to hand off to some government planner somewhere. It's a problem for all of us, homeowners, citizens, firefighters, whatever. It is a collective problem, and I think that the, there are tools, as Dan has stated, the homeowners need to take the responsibility as well as community, community leaders in the form of uh, building codes and zoning ordinances to assist the, the fire organizations to be better prepared to, uh, to mitigate these problems that we see along with the partnership and the compliance by the uh, homeowners to these different kind of rules and regulations to assist them in uh, keeping their homes safe. Well, is it getting any easier? Is awareness of this problem being raised enough that people respond as they should? Are you getting the public support that you need as a firefighter to be able to stay in the firehouse and not be out there putting out fires? It's slow to catch on. Uh, there are isolated areas in our, in our part of the state uh, that now are very aware of the firewise concepts, but for the most part, people think that when the fire threatens, that the fire department and the forestry service are going to be there to protect them, and in reality, there's so many houses and so many people in the interface that we don't have the resources to protect every house and every person. Dan, is there a single point you'd like to make before we close out this segment? Oh, well, I think, About again, uh, I, I agree. I think that, that we have watched America change over the last two decades with increased numbers of homes lost and, and more and more fires, more people living in the interface areas, and it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just the fire service. Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this, this section of our program today has been an introduction. It's not the final answer. It's not designed to do anything more than just get you aware and get you involved, because your involvement, your awareness is, in fact, clearly our best defense against this growing problem across America. We've not tried to offer you all the answers, just raise some of the questions and hope that you'll continue to raise the questions in your communities, because these are the questions that you and your community should be asking yourselves. Let's turn our attention now to items of special interest to our firefighters. Firefighters, the first line of defense against fighting fires, saving lives, saving property. And of course, in the wake of 9-11, they are now on the front lines of homeland security. We'll hear about value programming, that's just a phrase to describe what you've learned to think in your training as a firefighter, how you look at and think about a fire. There are differences between the outlooks of building and wildland firefighters. Bill Mills out in Colorado Springs, how have you seen these differences? My observation is that structure firefighters, wildland firefighters, it, there's, there's a subtle difference between tempo and scale of the event. And again, I'm talking about intuitively at a very gut level per perception that, that the scale of the wildfire event tends to be more campaign oriented. The scale of the urban event tends to be more skirmish oriented. The tempo of those events, uh, if we could use the comparison in the urban, maybe more like a sprinter with a skirmish. 
and I'm saying a skirmish may lay at last up to one burn period, up to 12 hours or even more. But this, this collision that occurs is we have a different perception of the scale of the event just intuitively at the gut level from the very start. The tempo of the event is different in that the campaign, uh, wildland firefighters and large events know going in that they're going to have to live uh, days and days uh, in an assignment. So that's my observation as far as differences, intuitive differences with wildland firefighters uh, and, the, and the urban or structure firefighter that just doesn't simply identify that we dress different or use different equipment or uh, show up in different boots. But right at the gut level, I think it's important to understand we just came from different places came from different places, but now you wind up the same fire. Will, that's got to be uh, an interesting experience the first time that, that uh, a building firefighter finds himself in the place of dealing with uh, a wildland fire, which was your experience, I know. Well, it, yes, it, it's something that can be a little <clears throat> frightening because your total experience uh, before as a structural firefighter through, through the actual experience of response and uh, fighting fire and all the training that you have been through is that you're responding to an object, it's uh, fixed, it has, uh, the sides are easily seen, uh, the fuels are confined, uh, you may go inside that confined structure to, to actually extinguish the fire, but the fire doesn't have the potential for going everywhere. Uh, once you take a look at a wildfire, even in the interface, you'll note that fuel is everywhere and that you know, conditions are gonna take that fire wherever it's going to go. So it's, it's a totally different experience and one which uh, everyone needs to begin to take notice of and for firefighter safety as well as, mm -hmm. as for citizen safety. Mike, now where Will started his firefighting career focusing primarily on building fires and so on and has had to learn about the others, you, you were just the opposite. So talk about that a little bit too, if you would. Well, I think it was. And from the wildland firefighter perspective is that uh, we were taught perimeter control. <clears throat> we're, we're looking to remove the fuel from the progressing fire and, and, to, uh, and to work in the environment as we talked about in the woods and, and sleeping in the dirt and those kinds of things. But what's happened to us, with, particularly with the wildland urban interface, is that we brought the two of us together, mm -hmm. I, I believe, and uh, the structure firefighter and the wildland firefighter are having to deal with many of the same, same items. The structure is, uh, can become part of the fuel component. Uh, there's can, can be hazmat issues. You don't know what the homeowner is uh, storing in that outbuilding that's, uh, that's in the wildland environment. So you have this new dimension. You have a, a evacuation dimension that you never had before in the wildland fire community. So it, it's, a, it's a whole new program for both of them, I believe. So wildland and urban, and, and they are different, but there are some stark commonalities between these two. Are there not, Bill? I think the common ground is very simply that if you don't have your thinking cap on, you can get dead in either arena right away. And so uh, common grounds are that, that we need to understand each other and, and train to standards, if you will, that we both understand, and to work harder on common language and, and common strategy and tactic than uncommon, and to uh, uh, stop drawing lines on, on who's who and, and learn from each other. Dan, he's uh, being starkly direct there, I guess, isn't he? I mean, he's not overstating. There is serious risk here to both types and major lessons to be learned for each side. Oh, absolutely. You look back in history and we've had some really serious incidents that involved death of wildland firefighters and structural firefighters as well. So it is serious business and uh, I think that uh, he makes a really good point. Uh, again, though, I think we need to stress that you know, he made a point about working together and erasing the lines. I think that's very important. People have to train together, work together, and as we have wildland fire incidents, mm -hmm. to integrate into the organization, the structural fire uh, component. So 
everyone has a piece of the puzzle uh, that understands that piece and can move forward in dealing with it. Well, a key part for any firefighter's safety as well as success in fighting the fire, though, is, is that first arrival. You first get there and assess what you've got. And you, you have to literally perform triage. That's correct. <clears throat> Typically, I mean, you always uh, performed a triage <clears throat> when you responded to a structure fire, but like I say, it was that isolated object there that you knew it wasn't going anywhere. You had to find a way to get inside and deal with it. Uh, nowadays, you have to deal with many more things. You have to look at the access. Can you get in and out safely to, to that particular structure or that area? Uh, what are the uh, maybe other objects that are immediately adjacent that could create problems for you? You have to take a look at all of these considerations. Number one, is it something that can be saved? Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe you can save it if you stay there, but is it safe to stay there and do it? Or you might be lucky and find a number of structures that really don't need any protection. You can move on down to another area and then conduct that same triage again. But the triage is very important, for fire, for, especially for firefighter safety. And it's got to be especially difficult when you have that situation where there's a build and, you're, and you've been trained, as Bill was talking about how to think about this, that there's a building there, there's a fire approaching it, I need to fight that fire, or do I need to put the fire out, out in the valley to save the other 50 homes? It's got to be very difficult. And a key skill, as he said, is for any firefighter, a key skill is triage. Deciding what to do first, what can be saved, what's beyond hope, and how to live to tell the tale. Let's look at some video now about how firefighters might approach this very critical task. In the process of triage, you quickly decide into which category a threatened structure falls. Needs little or no attention for now. Needs protection, but is savable. Is hopeless. Your decision is based not just on looking at the structure alone, but on five factors. The structure itself, the surrounding fuels, the fire behavior, available resources, and firefighter safety. Let's break these factors down one at a time and see just what to look for. Starting with the structure itself, is it susceptible or not? Take a look at the roof. Is it made of combustible materials such as untreated wood shakes or tar paper? Or is it made of tile, metal, or fiberglass, which won't burn? Finally, are the gutters full of hazardous debris? Next, check the siding to see if it is made of combustible wood or non-combustible metal, brick, or adobe. Also look for heat traps like open gables and unscreened vents and decks. And what about windows? Large windows can be an entryway for heat and windblown debris. Curtains or drapes inside can create even more of a hazard. Shutters on the outside, however, can be used to shield the windows if there's time. The size and shape of the house should also be considered. Gables, vents, and eaves can trap both heat and flaming debris, as well as create dangerous wind patterns around the house. The next category to check is surrounding fuels. Note the loading, what these fuels are, their size and arrangement. Also notice whether they're old and dry versus young and green. How close are they to the structure? Are they fire resistant or flammable? It's good to be aware of fire tolerant or fire resistant species, both native and exotic, before you approach the fire. Also check for hay or straw stacked outside or in adjacent buildings. Other things to look for in the way of fuel include its flame or heat duration. Is it long burning? Are wooden railroad ties or fences placed around the structure? What exists in the way of defensible space and access to the structure? Is the yard clear or cluttered with junk? Are any explosive above ground fuel tanks visible? The next category is fire behavior, which again goes back to your first observations on the fire scene. First check the speed and direction of the fire, noting any topographic influences like steep slopes. What's the weather doing now? How long are the flames? The longer they are, the more intense the fire. Are there spot fires or fire brands? How much time until the fire reaches the structure? Now let's go over your resources, what you have available, and when. What is actually on site now? What kind and type of resources do you have available? How many? Where are they? And if they're off site, where will the fire be by the time they arrive? Look at the resource capabilities and limitations in terms of mobility, especially water, foam, or retardant. Throughout this process, Always consider firefighter safety, starting with routes of ingress and egress. 
Are roads to the structure one way or two way? Is there a heavy canopy of fuels over the road or power lines? What is the grade and surface of the road? Are there loops or cul-de-sacs too narrow for turning emergency equipment? Is smoke beginning to obstruct visibility near the property? What hazardous materials, if any, are nearby? How do you quickly decide that a situation is hopeless? If any of the following factors apply, think very hard about attempting to save the structure. The situation may be hopeless when the fire is making significant runs in the standing live fuels and the structure is within one or two flame lengths of those fuels. Two, spot fires are starting around the structure or on the roof and beginning to grow faster than you can put them out. Three, your water supply will not allow you to continue firefighting until the threat subsides. Four, you cannot safely remain at the structure and your escape route could become blocked. Five, the roof is more than a quarter involved in windy conditions. And six, interior rooms are involved and windows are broken in windy conditions. If things change or you begin to lose the battle, you're always free to rethink your plan, but don't continually question or regret your decisions as precious time will be lost. This isn't a situation that allows for perfection, but only for your best judgment and a good follow through. Best judgment and good follow through. See, it's that simple, <laughs> right? Mike, just that simple. That's gotta be the toughest thing to do is that you're always having to change your plan and that making changes doesn't mean you've had a failure now. You, you, nope. You've got to go with what's happening. Well, you need to assess the situation and assess what's going on around you and adjust accordingly. The, uh, it, I don't think it's any different from the wildland fire personnel to the structure fire. Those issues have to be, uh, have to be addressed. I think the important thing in this environment is, is that the folks are working together. They're, 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 they come together, they know each other when they come together. I think understanding each other's problems and issues is a very important part of this process. And uh, having agreements ahead of time and meeting with your partners and, uh, is going to be a key for success on the fire ground. Dan, what would you say are the most important lessons the firefighters ought to learn about, I guess what you'd say would not have been their primary focus when they first began their firefighting? Either Wildland about buildings, building firefighters about wildlands. Well, I think that uh, uh, firefighter safety for the public and for the, the firefighters themselves is key, and, and that's always stressed, but sometimes in the heat of the battle, it gets overlooked. So I think that that, uh, that issue needs to be right there on top. I think the other thing that's important, uh, as Mike mentioned, is uh, from a planning perspective of making sure if you're a structural department that you're integrated with the wildland uh, incident team that's dealing with the fire uh, in that situation but at the same time you know knowledgeable about things from a planning perspective that have been accomplished prior to that so know both sides of the coin and, and be a part of that process is real important Will, what would you tell the guys in the firehouse, because you've had some experience in this area, what would you tell the guys in the firehouse works to follow through on what Dan's suggesting here? I would be proactive. I, wouldn't, I would not wait for someone to bring the training to me or the opportunity to meet with my wildland counterparts. Uh, take the opportunities that are out there. The, the, the wildland uh, departments, state and federal, offer wildland firefighter training and supervisory training. Uh, find out about that. You can access that information from web pages or contact with a local district or, or a forest management office. Uh, like I say, don't wait. Get out there and learn it sooner. The sooner, the better. And uh, and get to know the folks that you'll be responding with. Uh, know them on a first name basis. Recognize their face. Uh, know how to contact them by radio or telephone. It's going to be very important in the in the very early minutes uh, of any uh, breaking interface fire. Mike, what about the same question from the other direction? The, what, what, what would you say to the, to the firefighters who are in the in land fire business for the most part, the wildland fire business, about making these connections that Dan was talking about? Well, I think that uh, in generally these situations will end up with intermingled land. You'll have a, you'll have a community and, and there won't be a clear distinction between the community and the wildland responsibilities. And because of that, you need to have mutual aid agreements. You need 
to, to know up front that these other resources are going to come to your aid and you have skills to come to their aid. Yeah, we've already mentioned about the training component. They need to train together and drill together at the local level, at the, at the, at the engine company level. At the same time, managers need to get together and know each other and know what their skill levels are so they can integrate them on the fire ground and come together under the same management structures. And that becomes especially important in consideration of the post 9-11 environment, I would assume, where you just have the communications back and forth amongst the different agencies and the departments. It's very, in this day and age, you would think that communications is straightforward and simple, but uh, we still have a lot of problems out there. People are working on that, but uh, uh, that's critical. I mean, absolutely critical. And I think it comes back into the training and and prepping before you get into a, an emergency situation so you know what all your limitations are and how to deal with them. Most of the attention and all the excitement is always on the fires themselves. They're spectacular, they are compelling, they are sometimes tragic, they're always destructive, and they, they get a lot of our attention. But a lot of what we're talking about here today has to do with what you do before the fire and how to keep it from becoming the big fire that it that it may uh, be slated to be if you don't act properly. So Bill Mills, I'd like to talk to you again. What You see the role of the firefighter, not just as a firefighter, but primarily as a fire preventer. Part of what you're being as a well-rounded firefighter is understanding all of those mitigation efforts that are so important prior to the ignition because the reality is that what we fail to mitigate in wildfire you are relegated to responding to and operating on. So the more you know about um, wildfire development review and how, how mitigation works with wildfire in the planning division, ha whether it be a city or a county, how your codes apply to any wildfire mitigation piece, who are your interagency cooperators? Is it just the other guys? Or do we know who they are and what their mission is? Um, if you have a firewise component in your local mitigation piece, um, understand what their mission is, what their tagline is, and communicate that to the community while you're not fighting the fire. If you're lucky enough to have a uh, an academic natural resource professional somewhere in your staff, uh, support them with wildfire mitigation planning and risk management pieces. But overall, the advice I would give is treat the events like a risk management piece. What is the cost? And I don't mean in dollars, I mean in human life or energy, and what's the benefit? I, uh, I think firefighters need to be done uh, dying for a cause if there isn't a, a benefit there on the other end. And we're here to help you try to put a good benefit on the other end because the cause is obviously important but it has to be handled properly and with the right respect and that's what we're counting on you to do and that's what we're hoping to help you with of course. But Bill, what about the scope of your efforts? I mean a local fire department does have its limits. If you live in a small community you can't be the U.S. Forest Service necessarily. Um, I, I think you have to think about building your response and your mitigation efforts as it relates to the community that you serve because in effect they will define your acceptable risk. Uh, think about that notion of establishing a dialogue with your community that the more you know about the wildfire event the more you're capable of communicating that to your community and they become your champion and that that's a little inverted for our thinking in the fire service but uh, from experience I can tell you that I've passed a class A roofing ordinance in a city of 400,000 people we have modified 3,000 roofs under that ordinance in the last 12 months I didn't do it. We educated the community and told them about spotting and branding, identified champions, and they took the issue to the policymakers. 
the policy makers caused the change to happen. Uh, in old notions of communication, we would have pointed a finger and said, this is what you have to do. So notions like systematic development of informed consent, they're not on an operational firefighter's radar. But as a fire service professional, they should be. So getting a lot on your radar, there is a lot out there already, is it there? Uh, Will, well, what do you think about that? Well, <laughs> I, would, I would tend to agree. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to get the, the, the structural firefighter, in many cases, to be thinking about wildfire unless it's wildfire season. And fortunately, it's uh, at different times of the year, but it's a short period of time in all locations. Uh, but I would, I would stress that uh, they need to become involved and engaged in the prevention side, the mitigation side. Uh, that is going to be the, uh, that's going to be what makes life a lot easier for them and a lot safer for them as they pursue their careers in the fire service. And, and uh, Mike, on the other side of that, when they're, um, when they're trying to reach out to the different communities, you know, one of the comments that Bill made was that if you're a local fire department, you can't be the U.S. Forest Service, you can't be a big agency and so on, but, but what can you be? How can they work together and how can you help the smaller departments? Well, the, all the federal wildland fire agencies have programs to assist rural and volunteer fire, fire departments. So that's, that's another key reason that the rural fire departments and, and even the larger ones need to get to know their, their wildland fire service partners because they do have programs, they do have training, and they are more than willing to come out and participate and be part of the solution and, and help with the, the, these actions. Dan, how can you uh, help these departments reach out to their communities and maybe build better understanding? Well, I think it, uh, it you know, and just following up on the, the, the other comments, that it's about the community as well. Uh, grassroots involvement for the, from the citizens out there, get their help, get their participation. And at the same time, what you want to make sure is that before you know you, you begin that process, that uh, as Mike said, you you're sitting down with your counterparts in the structural and wildland agencies at the table, and getting your act together before you go out there and you deal with the community. So you look like you're a cohesive you know uh, group that's dealing with the issue rather than individually. Before we run out of time for this segment, uh, talking to our firefighters, well, I'd like to, and I'll ask all of you to do this. I'd I'd like you if you could wave your your magic wand, your magic fire hose, whatever. The, the, the one thing you think that, that if firefighters knew or could do better or make sure they do regularly or whatever that would most benefit us across the country who need their help? For the greatest benefit would be to begin to bring this, uh, well I would say the, the Firewise Communities uh, concept to the local community and to, to take that to the citizens. And, and begin to make a difference, which you have to do through the local growth management policies. Uh, if, we can, if we can do that, then we can get at the, we can get at the very root cause and, and begin the mitigation and prevention processes and, and keep these things from happening. Mike, same question from your perspective. Well, my perspective is that the uh, leadership <clears throat> needs to be part of the, part of the equation. I mean, the political leadership as well as the community leadership from the citizens. And if everybody is working on the same page and are willing to accept the, uh, the building ordinances and the zoning ordinances to, to apply fire safe principles, we're going to make the, make the operation safer for the citizen and we're going to make it safer for the firefighter. Dan, how, what do you think is the best way to do that, assuming you basically agree? What's the best way to do that in, the, in this context? Each state has its own laws, each municipality its own regulations, its own considerations, culture, uh, history, all of those things. What we're talking about is common sense, and the question is how do you best implement it community by community, do you think? Well, I think the success in the United States over the last three or four years has been with the Firewise program that we mentioned earlier. It's a mechanism to bring community members, uh, bankers, realtors, as well as the structural and wildland departments together at the table to sort out local grassroots issues on a community basis, which is 
you know, can be different in Phoenix, Arizona or uh, in uh, upstate New York. Uh, it, it takes that community group sitting down and solving the problems for their local area and can to make it work. Can the Forest Service help some of these local departments? In Absolutely. I think the, okay. the departments that uh, need help can contact the local federal, state uh, agencies for, uh, for assistance to put that together and make it happen. And well, I know the fire chief's organizations, a couple of them, the state organizations and the national organizations, have some materials, advice, support that you can offer to the, to the folks in the firehouse. That's correct. And, and we're primarily a conduit uh, from the Firewise Communities Program, the several federal agencies, uh, through both the International Association of Fire Chiefs and, in, in my case, the Florida Fire Chiefs Association. Mm -hmm. we, we bring that information and that material to the local fire department and to the local community. And, and should they work through their own chiefs or their own departments? How, what would you suggest at a practical level they should do? Well, it, uh, they, they of course need their chiefs uh, a nod of the head mm -hmm. for such programs and hopefully the department head would be, take a lead role in that. But yes, they need, to, they need to go ahead and engage all the resources of the department. It would not be just the suppression side, but prevention, public education, all those other areas, uh, and hopefully local emergency management even into that process uh, to, to get the public involved and then get directly to the elected officials because I think you're really going to see that the, the future of making this change uh, as a positive change is going to be to modify growth management policy. Mike, we've only got about a minute and a half left, so I'll ask each of you one more question. That is, what, what advice would you have or comment would you have for the folks watching this today, the firefighters? What would you hope they take away from this and remember? For the, for the grassroots, for the, for the tailboard firefighter, I would suggest, suggest they need to be partners with their wildfire community, and the wildfire community needs to be partners with them. They need to train together, drill together, and, and know each other's strengths and, and uh, limitations and build on those and so that they're so that when they get to the fire ground they have a stronger role in a, in a, in a uh, they're just more cohesive when they get there to go to work. Will? Uh, I, will uh, I will agree with that and I'll go to the next step and, and that is for the managers of those ser services to also get together to develop the plans uh, so that when something happens that bridges both of these communities that we don't have to sit back and wonder, well, who, who should I contact? But we know who to contact. We already have a plan of action. Dan, real fast, please. Uh, remember, uh, firefighter safety, public safety is our number one mission to uh, keep uh, focused on. Thanks, all of you. So we have seen an overview of the challenges we face in fighting the fires. We've seen this growing problem and what, we, what you can do about it. We've tried to have a start at this, not a finish. Talk about the right approaches to reducing risk of death, injury, and loss in your communities from wildland and urban interface fires. I want to thank all of you for participating today. Very helpful. We think very informative. Most of all, thank you for all of your work, and thank you for joining us today.